I was going to grow fodder for my animals. <laughs> Do you hear the stubbornness behind that statement? <laughs> My name is Delcy, I'm founder of A Life of Heritage, and I'm on a mission to help you raise animals and profit on your property. I had read all the articles on fodder, and I was ready. I even had made my fodder shelving and bought these awesome, durable, heavy seedling trays. I was ready. As you can see, I was set and ready to go. And then I decided to do a bit more research. I'm really good at jumping in and just doing something and then later wondering what in the world I was thinking. Are you like me in that respect? <laughs> I kind of hope not. But I know that there were three very specific things that had to happen if I was going to grow fodder for my animals. It had to lower the feed bill considerably, not add a crazy amount of time and work into my day, and of course, I wanted my animals to have a boost in their health. In other words, it had to be worth it. Worth the time investment and not be a detriment to our pocketbook. If you are already raising livestock, you already know this. Animals cost a lot of money. They are not cheap. And at every turn, we are looking for ways to raise healthy animals and save some money. So in this video, I want to talk about the pros and cons of fodder. And I'll bring up quite a bit of information that is not talked about in most articles you will find online. But I want to make it clear. I want to, to open up a discussion, an honest discussion for those interested in doing fodder and with those who are currently doing fodder as the main feed source for their animals. There is a difference in doing a small tray of fodder every once in a while for 20 chickens and having a regular system set up to feed goats, pigs, chickens, and possibly a cow or two. So, Share this video to help me get this conversation started so we can really get to get a discussion going if fodder makes sense for, for those of us who are raising a small number of animals with limited resources, time, and probably money. And don't forget to subscribe. There is a lot of great information coming your way. Who did I turn to for my information about fodder? I knew that it had to go deeper than the average blog post. I wanted to know really what was going on with feeding fodder and one of my first goals was to be able to create a calculator like the ones I've already created and linked below for myself and you to be able to use to calculate how much grain in pounds it would take to grow enough fodder in weight for the specific amount of animals that were owned. This seemed easy enough. So I reached out to the Montana State University and found a very helpful and informative professor under the title Extension Forage Specialist, Department of Animal and Forage Sciences. And I asked a lot of questions. I knew I had to ask a lot of questions because I was thinking seriously about setting up a fodder system that would need to feed 10 goats at least two sows, 25 chickens, eight guineas, and, and possibly a couple bum calves every day of the year. I didn't want to just do fodder for the sake of doing fodder. I needed it to almost completely take over as the main food source for my animals. So let's start with the definition of fodder and what that word even means. The definition of fodder, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is this. Something fed to domestic animals, especially coarse food for cattle, horses, goats, and sheep. Very specifically speaking, fodder is the food that is fed an animal by an owner as opposed to forage. Forage is the food that an animal will find for itself in a designated pasture or area of grazing. More recently, there has been a resurgence of interest in sprouted grains, also known now as fodder. Usually the grains are sprouted to about six inches tall, which will take approximately between six and ten days. 
the wheat gold sprouts are fed to the animal in its entirety, meaning the leaves, the grass, roots, and any remaining seeds that didn't sprout are all fed to the animal and eaten. No dirt is involved. In this quick turnover of seed to grass, there is no need for dirt. Dirt and the roots become a heavy mass that is rolled up and toted out to the animals. Generally speaking, it is fairly easy to grow fodder. One article says that it is practically effortless to grow sprouted grains. As a quick overview, here are the steps that people take to grow fodder to about six inches. So first, you will have to clean the seed if it wasn't pre-cleaned before purchase. You'll need to soak that seed for at least 12 hours and up to 24 hours. You'll lay the seed out in a tray no deeper than half an inch. And these trays are seriously so awesome and durable. I am so happy with my purchase with these. And then the seeds are should be wet down with water two to three times a day and drained well each time. No standing water should be left in the trays. And then you do step number four until the growth has reached six inches. This will usually take between six and ten days depending on um, the room temperature and the amounts of water that we used for each watering. And then you harvest it. You dump out the fodder, it's heavy, and either you roll it up or cut it into manageable pieces and then you feed it to your livestock. Then you will have to disinfect and clean these trays immediately and very, very well after each use. And then you repeat this each day. So every day as tray is taken out, one replaces it, making this a continual cycle of growing and harvesting. Fodder systems can be as easy as setting up like a small container in the windowsill and can, it can be set up to be completely automated after the seed is in the trays. Some systems can be connected to a water source where the water is reused and pumped to rinse the seeds throughout the day automatically, which is nice, which, which helps less than the time actually spent manually rinsing the seeds several times a day. So what are the benefits of sprouted fodder? Any article about sprouted fodder will give a very impressive list of benefits. And who wouldn't want these benefits for their animals? This list is found on many websites touting the benefits of growing sprouted seeds. Water use reduction and conservation compared to like field irrigation. There's a reduction in the overall daily feed costs, significant reduction of feed waste, the entire root mass is consumed with the grass, there's an increased nutritional value in the feed, there's a high yield in a very small area, you can increase your dependence on growing food for your animals with no need for cultivated land, there's high digestibility, there's vitamins and mineral saturation, phylate reduction for pH normalization, enzymatic activity increase, increase in omega-3, amino acids and natural hormones. There's a hedge that you know they increase in the feed costs by pre-buying buying like large amounts of grain to have on hand. And there's it's an on-demand availability of fresh green feed 365 days a year, all season access. But the impressive list isn't the beginning or the end of this discussion. There's more, a lot more. Let's explore if the grass is really greener on the other side. The true cost of sprouted greens. In my research, I found that when, when talking to people who know what they're talking about in regards to animal nutrition, a lot of the wording and technical aspects of the conversation can quickly go over my head. The, the subject about nutrition and the bioavailability of starches, sugars, and the makeup of grains and hay can go deep and get complicated very quickly. Not only can grains and grasses grown in different pastures and parts of the country have a completely different nutritional content, but when and where and how these were harvested also affects the outcome of the feed as well. And all grains are not created equal either. Depending on the dirt health, harvesting, age, and how long they were sprouted all change the outcome of what ends up being fed 
to an animal. So in short, to say that my quality in nutritional makeup is exactly and equal to your, your hay or grain is impossible, which would also mean that my barley grain, <laughs> the sprouts I produce, could not be said to be equal or better or worse without testing the specific grains used and the final fodder product. <laughs> is this getting heavy? I hope not. Bear with me. Because this is when the whole fodder conversation gets blown <laughs> out of the water. The truth about fodder. Well known or not, animals' rations must be calculated and fed on dry matter basis only. This is so important. I must say it again. Animals must be fed on a dry matter basis only. What is dry matter and why is it important? Okay, imagine that the food you feed your animals is two things, dry matter and wet matter. The wet matter is the water and water is important for animals, very important. And it is important to know the amount of moisture in feed because it does affect the weight of the food, especially in the case of fodder. But it doesn't have any nutrients in it. That is what the dry matter is, the nutrients in the food. So dry matter is obviously very important and why you should base your feeding program on dry matter. Dry matter is the nutrients in the food. If you've done any research on fodder, one key phrase may have caught your attention. One pound of grain turns into six pounds of fodder. And what did you think? Like me, possibly? Oh, wow, that's amazing. How else can you multiply feed like that? But it's a very deceiving claim. Why? Because of dry matter. If you have lugged around a mat of fodder, you know how heavy it is, incredibly heavy, and all of that weight is moisture. In fact, fodder is made up of, up of about 80% plus moisture content compared to the 15% moisture found in hay. This is the reality of fodder. Two pounds of grain which has approximately 95% dry matter, which is about 1.9 pounds of grain, grows into grass in six to 10 days, which weighs at this point 12 pounds and has 10% dry matter. Two pounds of grain, 95% dry matter. Two pounds of grain turns into 12 pounds of fodder. 12 pounds of fodder is 10% dry matter. So what has the dry weight of the fodder become at this point? In terms of dry matter, the equation will look like this. 1.9 pounds of dry matter grain equals 0.9 to 1.2 pounds of dry matter fodder. Wait, what? The fodder has actually lost dry matter. For every two pounds of starting seed, it will in fact have lost almost one pound of dry matter. And why does this matter again? Because animals are fed on a dry weight basis. And when you are crunching numbers like I do continually, losing feed is not an option. And if it happens, it is very costly and can be detrimental to the bottom line. But how does this even happen? What is going on inside the seed to lose that dry matter? The reason behind the loss of dry matter in fodder. When a seed is growing into a plant, it, it uses up the stored carbohydrates. The stored starch is used up during the first week of life. Usually at this point, photosynthesis uh, takes over, the roots develop, and the plant begins to take up the nutrients and the minerals. But in the case of hydroponic systems, dry matter and carbon are being used up during the, the 10 to 14 days of growth, which leads to the loss of dry matter. So the longer the sprouts are growing to reach the desired six inches of growth, the more dry matter they are losing. What about the previously mentioned nutritional quality improvements? Sadly, because I really like the idea of growing fodder, there isn't any valid research backing up the nutritional quality improvements. Now, do animals usually love the fodder? Oh, yes, they do. Chickens might knock you down to get to their fodder treats. <laughs> the fresh, moisture-filled product is very palatable and pleasing to most animals. But the reality is that 
The research done on the nutrition of fodder shows that not only is there a loss of dry matter, but the true protein actually decreased and the non-fiber carbohydrates, metabolic energy, and in vitro gas production decreased in sprouted barley compared with the raw seed. What does this mean for the fodder product? It has lost energy and has actually lost feed value when it is compared to the original seeds themselves. Those barley seeds, their feed value is at least as good, if not superior, to the fodder. If you do decide to grow fodder, studies have shown that growing fodder to day four will have the least amount of dry matter loss and will have the best digestibility. Growing past that day four will show a significant loss in dry matter energy and digestibility. Another factor that I hadn't considered with this was this. Thomas and Reddy in 1962 from the Michigan State University compared eight day sprouted oats against whole or, or crimped grain when fed to dairy heifers. The digestibility of dry matter, protein, and energy were significantly higher on the processed grain diet than on the sprouted oat diet. Dairy urine production increased from 4 liters on the control diet to 13 liters per day on the sprouted oat diet. So bedding needs would increase significantly to keep the cattle clean and dry on the sprouted oat diet. Does this mean that it never makes sense to grow fodder? No, not necessarily. Maybe there would be a time when it would make sense. So when would it make sense to, to sprout grains? Here are a few times when it would make sense to grow fodder. You may have a, a low or maybe no sources of quality hay in your area. You have a desire to be more self-sufficient while not owning land to hay. It, it may be given just as a small treat to, to your chickens or your animals or rabbits and they will love it or you want to provide a varied diet for your animals. If you fall into one of those categories, great, but don't forget to count the cost first. This will probably not be something that will save time, money, or feed. Now let's talk about what some of the pros and cons are and the challenges of growing fodder. This will be another important factor that I had to consider, despite my adamant desire to grow fodder for my animals, I wasn't going to just grow a batch here and there of fodder. My original plan was to use fodder to supplement my hay and, and what we had to harvest and stack each year for my animals. But I had to ask the hard questions. How much time <laughs> would I have to devote a day to growing fodder? What are some of the challenges that come up and cause problems? Are you like me? <laughs> Lots of animals, young kids, a busy life. <laughs> I am looking for ways to simplify and improve. So what challenges come for those who grow fodder? The nutrient quality is solely and only dependent on the quality of the seed bought because only water causes it to grow. Low nutrient grain, low nutrient fodder. Mold. That rich brown dirt <laughs> that you see outside your window, it is wonderful microbes that keep pathogens at bay. In a hydroponic system, mold, mildew, and other pathogens can spiral quickly out of control if the proper temperatures, humidity levels get out of control. And a moldy batch of fodder cannot be fed to animals, which is just another potential loss. A controlled climate is needed to keep temperatures and humidity at appropriate levels. Time spent cleaning the seed. If it wasn't pre-cleaned, you've got to, to clean it. Laying the seed out, soaking the seed, watering it if you don't have an automatic water system, cleaning the trays to prevent, you know, the mold and, and feeding the fodder. They just, it all adds significant amount of time to chores. Fodder is an everyday, not miss a day type of system. No time off for you or the fodder. It's also very wet and heavy and it can become a challenge to transport. Depending on who you talk to, some found that their animals actually decreased milk production. Bulk feed storage sometimes can be a limiting and challenging factor. 
electricity and water sources are, are needed and depending on just the setup and the location that can sometimes cause challenges. <laughs> but where there is a will, there is a way. Sometimes challenges can be mastered and if your heart won't be content until fodder is made available for your animals, don't let these reasons stop you. So before we dive into the conclusion of growing fodder for your livestock, I want to remind you to subscribe and join me on my learning and adventures. And now, what is the conclusion? Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with growing fodder for your animals. Many people have jumped on the idea of growing sprouted grains. It feels like something you just should do, right? And if you are looking for ways to save time, money, and feed, this probably isn't the solution you are looking for. No matter which way the equation is looked out, sprouted feeds are more time consuming. They're less dry weight, less nutrient dense than hail. They're, they take up a lot of space in the house or the greenhouse or the garage. They're probably not going to save any money or feed, but I gotta tell you, I want fodder to be all that and a slice of bread. <laughs> I really do, but the facts can't be overlooked. Just because the internet <laughs> says so in a handful of places or because I want them to. Fodder has made a resurgence, but it's worth looking into the facts a little more deeply, isn't it? The grass just may not be greener on the other side after all. I provided a bunch of links below to keep you thinking and reading about this topic. But most importantly, I want to hear about your experiences. If you do grow fodder as the main source of food for your animals, how does it work for you? How much time a day are you spending on it? How hard has it been to keep it mold free? Any, and maybe was there any losses that you didn't expect? Help us out and show us what you got. Thank you for joining me in this Is the Grass Greener on the Other Side adventure. My name is Delcy, and I will see you next time.